a very special program, and I'd like uh, Claire to come up and to introduce that program. This is Claire Rudell, the mother of the Quanta Parker exhibit. Ms. Palmer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm very pleased to introduce our actors tonight. They are two very special friends, and I'll introduce Miss Debbie Carl. She's a well-known actress and performs in the Fort Worth area. She is administrative assistant and historian for Sid Richardson Museum. I've seen Debbie many times do acting, and she is absolutely wonderful. And she is doing this as a special, uh, a special uh, program because not too many people uh, act, react, uh, do Cynthia Ann uh, because it just, it's just difficult to do her. She's done a lot of studying about Cynthia Ann and she has great big blue eyes like Cynthia Ann Parker did. So we're happy to have her tonight. And Jerry Eastman will be her interviewer. Jerry's been involved with historical 1880s reenacting and melodrama for, uh, since 1994. His main character is Bat Masterson. I don't think he's going to be back tonight, but he'll be a great interviewer for Cynthia Ann. So without further delay, I'll introduce uh, Jerry Eastman, who will be, whose main character is Bat Masterson. So that's probably what you're going to see him as tonight, but we'll see. Okay, Jerry? No, Jerry's going like this. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege tonight to be able to interview a person who has survived a capture of not one, but twice, Miss Cynthia Ann Parker. Miss Parker, thank you so very much for allowing us to talk with you tonight. Uh, uh, but please, please do sit down. Are you comfortable? Very well, let's get started. Uh, can you tell me of your earliest memories? Mm. My earliest memories, I was a young girl riding in a wagon with pale-faced people who <clears throat> I must believe were my parents. I remember my brother John and some other small children traveling with us. There were several wagons, all traveling together, families, old ones. We had traveled a long way, and finally it was decided that we would stop in a clearing where there were large trees nearby. I remember the men built a fort, they called it, with very tall walls with points at the top of them, and we lived inside those walls. I remember playing with the children. I remember gathering water and firewood. I remember the fort had two gates, a large one in front and a smaller one in back, and we were always supposed to keep those gates closed because we were always warned that the Indians might attack us, so we had to be watchful. Um, how old were you at this time? Oh, I don't know, but I have been told I was nine years old. Uh, that would have been a May of 1836. If you say so. Uh, do you remember the attack on the family fort? Yes. It was early in the day. The men had all gone out to work in the fields. <coughs> Uncle Benjamin was still in the fort and he saw some Indians approaching. He went out to speak with them. He was out for a little while and he came back in and told us that they were asking for food and water but he did not believe them their horses were wet. Why did they need water? He suspected that they were up to nothing good. But he did go back out and gave them food and water, but he left the large gate open. The Indians killed him. They filled him full of arrows. They scalped him. They rode their horses into the fort. There was so much screaming and yelling. Mother hustled all of his small children out to the back gate and we tried to hide, but they found us. 
mother was forced to put me and my brother on a horse with the Indians and we rode away. I was so frightened. I did not know where we were going. We rode for such a long time. I was crying. Um, about how long did you ride? We rode until late in the night. At some point we stopped. They made a small fire and chanted and sang. And we were given no food. A little bit of water, but we, our, hand, our hands were tied and our feet were bound. I was so scared. So scared. Uh, was your brother with you? Yes. Uh, and how long did you stay together? Mm. I think it was six days, and then the large group split up. I never saw my brother again. When this group split up, uh, what happened then? I was given to a couple who lived in a teepee, a man and a woman. Uh, you stayed with these people? Yes. Did they hurt you? Not really. I was made to understand that I had to help. Help? Yes, I had to help out in the Keith TP. I had to gather water and firewood. Did these people teach you anything? Oh, yes. They taught me their language. They taught me how to cook food the way they liked. They taught me how to skin buffalo and how to turn the hides into teepees and clothing. Uh, what other things did you do while you were there? Well, I tended the horses, or I helped tend the horses. I learned how to pack the horses when we were getting ready to move. And I learned how to unpack the horses when we arrived where we were going. I learned how to cut up buffalo meat, and I learned how to dry the meat. Were you scared? No. No, not really. I was well treated. I was a good worker. They had become my family. Did you know that your father was looking for you? No. I am told Colonel Williams saw you at one time. Uh, he saw that you were a uh, white woman and that you, he wanted to purchase you while you were at the Canadian River. Uh, do you remember him? Yes. Uh, he said you didn't want to speak with him. He stated your lips shuddered. Uh, why didn't you want to speak with him? I did not want to speak with him because I knew if I did, he would try to take me away. I was well treated. I did not want to leave. Okay. Uh, you were married to uh, Peta Nakona? Yes, I was. I gave Peta three children, Kwana, Pecos, and Topsana, our baby girl. Uh, would you tell me about your capture at the, in, 18, uh, in 1860 at the Peace River? It was early on a winter's morning. We were camped by the river. The men had gone out on a hunting party. Suddenly, the soldiers attacked us. There was a lot of confusion, yelling, gunfire, horses. I grabbed my baby and my buffalo robe, and I tried to get to my horse, but I was captured. One who could speak the words of the people took me to one of the white soldiers and told him that I was the wife of a chief and that I was a white woman. I was then taken to the chief soldier. He looked at me and saw that I had blue eyes and he knew also that I was not a people by birth. 
Uh, that chief soldier was Saul Ross. Yes. He took me away from the people. He took me to a fort where people asked me many, many questions. Uh, were you frightened? Well, yes. I would not speak. One who spoke the words of the people assured me that I would not be harmed. And I asked him, where was my husband and sons? I needed to know where they were. They had been gone on a hunting party, but no one would tell me anything. Eventually, the officers at Camp Cooper, where you had been taken uh, by uh, Captain Ross, uh, contacted Isaac Parker, uh, your uncle. He came to uh, Camp Cooper. Uh, did you recognize him then? No. The one who spoke the words of the people asked me if I could remember anything about my past life, and I told him that I remembered living in a house in an open area with plenty of woods nearby. Colonel Parker wasn't sure you were his niece until he spoke your name. How did you respond when he said yours, when he said that? I stood up and said, me Cine Ann. A small memory had come to me when I heard those words. I had pale-faced parents, and I had had a pale-faced name. I had lived with them. The only name, however, I could remember was that of John. Uh, your brother John? Yes. Uh, when, you were, when your true identity was uncovered at, at that meeting, uh, you were Cynthia Parker, who was taken captive by Comanches in 1836. Yes. You were finally reunited with your family. Did that make you happy? No. No? Well, why not? I did not know these white people who claimed they were my family. My family were the people of whom I had been taken away. These white people had strange customs. They did things that were so different from the way I had known them. When I was at the fort, women who were there took me and washed me. They took away my buckskin clothing. They made me wear white women's clothes. No, I was not happy. I see. For 25 years, you lived as a Comanche. And because of a brief raid, you were whipped away from the people you knew and loved. Yes. Your family. That's true. Well, what happened next? Well, I had my baby with me and we traveled with uncle. And where did you go? Mm. We traveled to a place called Fort Worth. What happened in Fort Worth? There were many people looking at us. Uncle took us to a house, a building, that we went inside and he indicated that I was to sit down. There was a man who had a black box and he showed us this black box and it made lightning. It startled me and it scared the baby. I found out later that that box was called a camera and it had captured our likeness in something they called a photograph. I was very glad to leave that place. I understand that many people <laughs> at Fort Worth wanted to see you and your baby. Yes, that's true. Oh, why was that? I don't know. I could not understand what they were saying. 
I knew that I needed to get away. I needed to escape to get back to the people. But there were too many white people around me all the time asking me questions, trying to get me to remember things of my past. Uh, so you were frightened? Yes. I did not speak. I held my baby close. Uh, did you ever want to leave your uncle? Oh, yes. I had to get back to my family. I missed them. I needed them. Why? Why? Why did you all leave your uncle? You were with white people now. I was raised by Comanche. I had a husband and children with them. I was one of them. I had overheard people saying that I was a heathen and that if I read words out of their Bible, I could be saved. Eventually, I did read those words, but they meant nothing to me. Did you stay long in Fort Worth? No, a few days. Oh, where did you go then? We went to the Parker home near Birdville. Uncle had people who lived near him that did not like me. To them, I was an Indian. They were not kind. Did you ever try to run away or leave? Yes. Several times I tried to run away, but I was always captured and brought back. Uh, you traveled to Austin, did you not? Yes. Yes, I did. Um, didn't your uncle make you a promise? He did. He promised me that if I would learn the words of the white man, that he would take me to see my sons. This encouraged me a great deal. And I did learn some of those words. But we did not ever make the trip. Well, why not? There was a big war that happened, something that I had first heard about when I was taken to Austin. When I was in Austin, we went into a very large building where there were many white chiefs talking. They were raising their voices, and I became frightened. I thought they were talking about me, what they were going to do with me, and I tried to run away then. But I was caught and brought back inside, and some of the ladies tried to explain to me that the white people were not talking about me. They were talking about a big war away from the prairie with other white men, and that is what happened. And Uncle decided that I needed to move away to live with my brother and his wife. Why did you leave? Hmm. The neighbors, the people did not like me. I was an Indian to them. The Comanches had attacked one of the farms nearby and burned the farmhouse. The people who owned it were sure that I had been responsible for it. If I had known the Comanches were near, I would have gone to them because they would have taken me to see my sons. But I did not know. So I left. My baby and I went to live with my brother Silas and his wife Mary. So you moved in with your brother. Uh, how did that work out for you? Not well. Not well at all. Brother's wife Mary did not like me. She did not like my baby. <clears throat> She did not want me in the house. She did not want me eating at their table. I tried to help her with things around the house. She would not let me do that. She did not like hearing the words of the people. So the best thing that I could do was spend as much time outside as possible. I worked with the horses. I chopped wood. I got, collected water. 
And when I was not being watched to make sure I did not run away, I could go into the woods with my baby Topsana and we could speak the words of the people. She was growing up so fast and I wanted to make sure that she knew things that the Comanche children should know. I remember one time I went into the forest and I cleared a space out on the ground and it was just dirt. And I drew a circle in the dirt and I made a cross in the middle of that dirt. I had taken some tobacco from uncle and I still had it and I sprinkled it over the cross and lit it and encouraged the smoke to rise to the great spirit. And I prayed to the great spirit asking for guidance and understanding. I did not trust my white family. I was very afraid. I cried a lot. So how was your life with them, though? Not good. Mary was expecting a child, and I think that may have been part of the reason she acted so badly toward me. When her time to deliver the child came, one of the ladies who lived nearby came to help her. I had placed some crow feathers underneath the mattress to help the baby come into the world more easily. Mary did not have an easy time with the pregnancy, and when the baby was born, he was not strong. He did not live. The lady found the crow feathers, and she and Mary thought I had put them there to curse the baby. But that was not true. That sounds like a hard time for you. Yes, it was. Well, did you and Mary ever get comfortable with each other? No. No. She did not like me. She had lost her baby. She wasn't thinking straight. She wanted me to leave. I finally did leave. When the men left to go to civil war, it was decided that I would go live with my sister Orlena and her husband. Ruff O'Quinn was his name. All right, and how did this move go? It was better. Sister and her husband were very kind to me. They were very, very fond of my baby, Topsana. Oh, she really wasn't a baby anymore. She was running and playing and learning to speak both the white men's words and the words of the people. Sister and her husband did not have children, and they were always buying little trinkets for her and giving her ribbons to put in her hair. She was a happy little girl and everyone liked her. There was a lady who used to come visit sister and she was very fond of my top Santa as well. One day when she was there visiting, very respectfully she asked me if Top Santa could go with her to visit some friends. Oh, I was afraid. I was afraid that this lady was going to try and take my baby away from me, and I was going to say no. But I saw Top Santa's little lips turn down into a frown, and I decided that I would change my mind and allow Top Santa to go with the lady. The whole time they were gone, I was worried. I could not sit still. I walked. I, I, I was very, very concerned, but the lady did bring her home. I was relieved. Did this lady take your child with her often? Almost every time she came to visit sister. 
she very respectfully would ask my permission to take her visiting. The last time Topsana went with the lady, she came home and said she was not feeling well. Her little eyes were bright. Her cheeks were flushed. My baby was sick. What were you feeling? I was scared. My baby had never been sick before. Uh, about how long was she sick? Not long. She had laid down, and I laid down beside her, and I must have fallen asleep. And when I woke up, she was cold. My baby was dead. I cried, I wailed, but my baby was gone. I was separated from my boys. And now, my baby was gone. Uh, this is so sad. Um, just, just a little bit more, if you don't mind. Uh, what did you do next? Oh. Sister and Mr. O'Quinn prepared Top Santa for burial. But they did it the white man's way. They put her in a wooden box and buried her in the ground. That was wrong. She was a Comanche, and that was not the Comanche way. My heart was broken, but there was nothing I could do about it. She was gone. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Parker lived another six years. She passed away in 1870. She was buried in the Fosterville Cemetery near Frankston, Texas. Her son, Quanah Parker, searched for his mother for several years. In 1910, he petitioned to have her body removed and buried on the reservation in Oklahoma. On February 23rd, 1911, Quanah Parker died. The family had been reunited. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for your attendance tonight. We thank you for your uh, being here. And we'll turn it back over to you. What a wonderful, sad presentation. And uh, I can just uh, imagine how wrenching it is to perform that. And Deborah, thank you very much. And Jerry, uh, you acted the role of a mean newsman, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> but but seriously, the, the yes, this, this story is such an important one to Fort Worth. And in and, and, uh, reliving it with us the way you did, you really you know, brought that really back. And, uh, and I'm hoping that uh, in, through all these different presentations, back, I think Rick Seltzer, did you come in? He's always sneaking around. I can see his hand back there, but but uh, uh, he will be talking about uh, 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 Peace Ross, uh, some a uh, young Mexican boy who was captured at the uh, Peace River massacre or battle, depending on how what you want to call it, uh, and which is a part of this story that uh, few people have known anything about. So you'll be discovering new things. The uh, Deborah and, and uh, Jerry both are very actively involved in reenactment groups here, and there's material about the uh, various programs that they uh, they are involved in it up at the uh, the table, and and I do think that this really that kind of reenactment uh, uh, really adds so much to our understanding, knowledge, and appreciation of, of history. So we really appreciate that. 
the the other uh, just uh, kind of a closing word is as we go through all of these different presentations and the history that is uh, reflected out there there are so many different dimensions to what uh, what were your what we just heard uh, what is before us the the whole you know it's societal or two worlds coming in collision uh, one world that really doesn't understand tribal kind of relationships in fact with the Comanches one of the things that it's uh, in a sense uh, a, a group of people around bands not so much even tribes so uh, when it came to trying to work out treaties and things like that with the Comanches that really wasn't possible because that's not how they were how they were structured um, in addition I think the the other thing you take away from this kind of uh, presentation is the human the very human factor of you know if we were living in that that time period the kinds of things that you know we would be facing and, and experiencing and, you know we're we're fortunate to be living in the, the world we're in and yet the world we're in throughout the world we're dealing with tribal issues and and uh, differences about religion and a whole series of things so I think uh, as, as we learn more and hear more experience more uh, I think there are a lot of applications to our life today and in the future that that uh, we should take away from this there's a bibliography up there that just touches kind of some of the kind of the uh, main points about this there's another one they're putting together which uh, brings up to date some of the the issues with uh, the indigenous people the Native Americans and and uh, uh, the issues that uh, have been faced right up until today of these different societies still tr struggling to understand each other and uh, work together so the uh, our wonderful actors are going to be here if you'd like to talk to them at the uh, conclusion of the program uh, I know the teachers are meeting next door uh, and if there are any other questions or we certainly hope that you come back to the other programs this Saturday I think will be a dramatic one next uh, uh, coming up on the uh, 18th, uh, Bob Bluehart, who uh, uh, heads the or manages the Fort Concho, uh, will be the speaker talking uh, from a military perspective of the U.S. military pursuing the Comanche Indians. And uh, in fact, Bob Bluehart is one who comes for the reenactment of the Fort Stays. Uh, is a good, good friend of, of ours, but uh, not far away at Fort Concho, Fort Parker, and many other places, you, know, you can go and see. Uh, this history firsthand. So, thank you for being here, and uh, our actors will be here to, to talk to you. Another round of applause.